The Gloriana Set by Sea of the Moon. Chapter 59. We have to stop meeting like this. Hermione found Monday classes very trying. News of the fallen stone block was all over the school. Half the student body thought she wanted to marry Draco, and the other half thought she wanted to murder him. Any day they'd see the headline in the prophet. Is she kissing or hexing him? Answers page six. Amused, Draco just made things worse, kissing her sweetly outside ancient runes and acting afraid of her impatience. Watch, she's going to try to poison me, he whispered hoarsely to Romelda. Theo looked at Draco disapprovingly, but said nothing. He had quite enough to do, fending off Lavender, who had taken Draco's shameless lie to heart. Don't you think Theo's shredding his fluxweed wonderfully? Draco asked the witch sitting beside him. Oh, uh, yes, Lavender said, looking at Theo with shining eyes. Would you like me to handle your girly road, Theo? I don't think you even need to ask, Brown, Draco said. Lavender giggled. Hermione and Theo glared. Draco's antics continued throughout the morning. He saw Hermione coming down the corridor after arithmancy and stepped behind Lila. Save me, I'm about to be hexed, he intoned as Layla rolled her eyes. Poison, hexes, just keep it up, Draco, Hermione told him in the great hall after lunch. You're only giving me ideas, and stop tormenting Theo. Hasn't he suffered enough? Certainly not, Draco said suddenly cold. I've made myself very clear to him. He is to stay the hell away from you, and... Draco, you can't... Mr. Malfoy! The squeaky mice raced into the hall and between the tables, skidding to a stop before the couple. Then they began jostling each other to be in front. Hermione eyed them with a side frown. Out of their Why I Won't Break Into Potions Labs essays, only Lila's and Bertie's had been truly adequate. Although she'd lifted the rainbow hex on all the mice anyway. Yes, Draco said coolly. Can you oversee her detention tonight? Imogen asked. Draco raised an eyebrow. Another one? What did you do this time? We are fan of the portrait, Bertie said. He, uh, didn't appreciate being called a bat. In our defense, he does look like a bat, Lila said. We didn't know it was a former headmaster. Hermione and Draco exchanged looks. What was the portrait's name? Hermione asked, almost afraid to hear the answer. Snape, Bertie said. No, Snipe, said Imogen. Snape? Snap. That's a stupid name. I wouldn't talk Percival. Excuse me, Draco said in glacial tones. Am I to understand that you are speaking of the former Hogwarts headmaster Severus Snape? The mice stood immediately, looking rather red. Yes, Mr. Malfoy, Lena said. And you called him a bat? Draco, Hermione said, putting her hand on his arm. She turned to the squeaky mice who were watching wide-eyed. Where is this portrait? In the divination corridor, Miss Granger, Percival said. Hermione fought down a smile. McGonagall and Snape must have had words in her office and she'd moved the portrait out. That simply won't do, Draco said sternly. Headmaster Snape's portrait will be treated with respect, and as for your detention with... Mr. Macmillan, Bertie said, you will treat him with respect as well, even if he is an I, Draco, an inspiring example of student leadership, Draco said. Why, Miss Granger, what did you think I was going to say? Hermione huffed and Draco turned back to the mice. Neither of us is available to oversee your detention tonight, he continued haughtily. I have Quidditch practice, and Miss Granger has an essay due in six weeks, plus a set of major exams only two hundred days away. You lot will behave yourself with the pet, Mr. Macmillan, understand? The children nodded, slightly chastened, and ran off chattering. I don't see what all this fuss is about. Yeah, that snap was very unpleasant. You were the one who called him a bat. How was I supposed to know? Do you think his nose really looked like that? Draco and Hermione entered the great hall with Draco rumbling. Severus hated divination. Hermione was a little annoyed as well. How could they slip into the Everard the Evil alcove with a painted snake glooming all over the corridor? They paused by the hourglass cabinet, now magically repaired with all the house tools restored to their proper levels. 
Draco was still frowning toward the divination corridor. Thin velvet ropes ringed the fallen stone block, which had been in the shadow all morning. Hermione stepped closer, curious, for something seemed different. As if on cue, the grey clouds outside parted, and a noontime sun shone through a window. A sunbeam fell directly on the fallen block, highlighting the red words on its cracked surface. Die mudbloods. The scene in McGonagall's office was tense. Once again, Kingsley and Harry stood before the fireplace in their aura robes, glaring at Draco. This time, however, both Hermione and Draco were seated in the armchair before McGonagall's desk. We have to stop meeting like this, Draco drawled. The tension in the room stemmed from Exhibit A, a photograph presented by Kingsley of Hermione and Draco in the Great Hall the day before. The moving picture portrayed Draco shoving Hermione and a stone block smashing the hourglass cabinet. This picture was shot by a student and slated for the front page of tomorrow's Daily Prophet, Kingsley said. I've managed to suppress it on legal and ministry security grounds, but it will get out. You can't think, Kingsley, that Mr. Malfoy, McGonagall began. Mr. Malfoy is very fortunate he was not holding his wound in that picture or had been custody already. Kingsley said, his dark eyes boring into Draco's. By that logic, Miss Granger would be locked up immediately as she is holding a wand, the headmistress said. Oh, I highly doubt Hermione would write those words. Die mudbloods, fear to say a thing only increases the fear itself, Hermione said, and Harry and Draco rolled their eyes. I understand that Mr. Malfoy is adept at wonders magic, Kingsley continued and he is shown here sorting Hermione. He was pushing me out of the way, Hermione cried, jumping to her feet. Draco also stood, looking curious. Kingsley, Harry said, I'm no friend of Malfoy's, but he would never. Then explain this! Kingsley boomed, slamming his hand on the picture on McGonagall's desk. Mr. Malfoy looks anything but calm in this picture, and Hermione's raising her wand. Well, she often does that, Harry said. You're saying Hermione goes around hexing people she likes? Kingsley asked. Sometimes, Harry admitted. And it's a very bad habit, Draco said, looking at Hermione reproachfully. Are you trying to say that this? Kingsley held up the picture. Is some sort of... He looked pained. Lover's tiff. Hermione and Draco both nodded energetically, and Harry groaned. You know how provoking he is, Kingsley. Hermione said. I oh, am, yeah, brother. Draco agreed. Kingsley glanced at McGonagall, who seemed to be suppressing a smile. Then he glared at Hermione and Draco. What exactly was happening in this picture? He demanded. Harry looked at Hermione pleadingly. She glanced at Draco, who nodded. Very well, she said in a lecturing tone. Draco and I were discussing my visit with Ron Weasley. I told Ron about our relationship, and Ron called me a Death Eater Hall. Hermione, Harry groaned, must you always say every damn fear of a thing only increases fear of nobody fears a death eater whore, Harry yelled. Potter, Kingsley boomed. McGonagall fixed Harry with a disapproving stare. What? She can say it, but I can't, Harry asked. McGonagall wrapped her wand on her desk. Maybe please return to the matter at hand. Draco was quite angry to hear what Ron called me. Hermione continued serenely. He pulled out his wand, planning to storm the burrow and hex Ron. Was Malfoy actually going to do that, or was it another case of him moving in a possibly threatening way? Harry wanted to know. Oh, I was going to do exactly that, Draco said. That weasel was going to be well and truly named, if you know what I mean. So I took Draco's wand, Hermione began, and I used a wandless freezing spell to make her drop it. So I pulled out my own wand to petrify him. Miss Granger, McGonagall cried. How could you attempt to petrify another student? Yes, it's uh, quite shocking, Draco said. Hermione ignored this. As I began to cast a spell, a stone block fell from the ceiling, nearly hitting me and breaking the bugbear cabinet. Excuse me, Kingsley said. The what cabinet? Wonderful, Hermione said to Draco. I can no longer say bugbear in front of people, and it's entirely your fault. 
You shouldn't have juggled them, he said. Does anybody know what the devil they're talking about? Kingsley demanded. I almost never do, Harry said. Nonsense, McGonagall said briskly. Miss Granger obviously means the house hourglass cabinet. So you expect me to believe these two were having a discussion, Kingsley asked, which turned into some sort of duel, and a stone block randomly fell from the ceiling and is later painted with a message in blood. And this is all coincidence. Yes, Harry and Draco said. No, Hermione said. The entire room stared at her. She sniffed, casting her headmistress to a ministry Aurus and her own boyfriend a look of contempt. Of course it isn't coincidence. There is a pattern to the dye mudblood messages, we just don't know it yet. And you claim Mr. Malfoy here has nothing to do with it, Kingsley said. I don't claim that at all, Hermione said. Hermione? Draco growled. I didn't say you did, but obviously you're involved in some way. Draco's eyes narrowed. If you're getting tired of me already, surely there are other ways. Hermione? Kingsley cut in, keeping his temper with difficulty. You say there is a pattern to these messages, and Mr. Malfoy may be involved in some way? Is that correct? Yes, she said. This all makes him look very bad. You are a terrible girlfriend, Draco said. Kingsley rubbed a hand over his bald head and sighed. So you're saying, Hermione, that someone could be framing Mr. Malfoy? She nodded. And took advantage of your little spat to do so. Hermione nodded again. I'm inclined to agree, McGonagall said. Aside from his possible justified resentment towards Mr. Weasley, there is no evidence that Mr. Malfoy means harm to anyone. The rest of the room gave a murmur of agreement except for Kingsley. That said, this is a very serious situation, McGonagall said. This is the third message to appear, and I've been getting hours and letters from parents of Muggleborn students. I now expect more. A number of students have already left Hogwarts. We have the inter-house quidded match in three days, and I expect a large number of guests. The headmistress looked at all of them, her face grim. And if we do not solve this mystery soon... These threatening messages could shut down the school. Like the Chamber of Secrets, Hermione breathed. Head or Shekepur, I would like to request assistant or potter's presence at Hogwarts until the situation is resolved, McGonagall said. It would help reassure both parents and students. We have Muggleborn staff members to think of as well. I also request aura security at the inter-house Quidditch match. Kinsley looked at her for a moment. Potter, he barked, and drew Harry nearer the fireplace, where the two auras began a whispered discussion. Oh, I see no point in Potter staying here, Draco said irritably. It is to lurk around the hall, sticking his nose in like in sixth year. Hermione glared at him. Every one of Harry's suspicions about that year was proven correct, Draco, and I, for one, feel better with him here. Draco flushed. So you do think I'm behind? Don't be ridiculous, Hermione said. Harry can help protect you as well. I don't need potheads. All right, headmistress. Kingsley stepped away from Harry. Potter has convinced me he might do some good here, so I will assign him to Hogwarts. Temporarily. And Aura's office will provide security at the Quidditch Met. Very good, Head Aura Shacklebolt, McGonagall said. About the other issue we were discussing. I do apologize, Hedora Shacklebot. The headmistress looked smug. But given the circumstances, I simply cannot spare the time to visit St. Mungo's. Celeste, Rosier cannot remain a pygmy puff, Kingsley insisted. She holds valuable information and nobody can return her to her original form. Nonsense. There is no reason why Sally's current form should impede your investigation. McGonagall sat, eyes gleaming behind her spectacles. Hermione looked at the old woman with interest. There was definitely some bad blood between the headmistress and the Death Eater witch. Surely, McGonagall continued, your clever auras can figure out a way to communicate. Kingsley scowled, then addressed Hermione. 
You say that was standard transfiguration, but think back, perhaps the incantation. I'm sorry, Kingsley. Hermione said, sounding much like McGonagall. I just don't know. It was a very hasty spell after all. But if you could just try to... Hermione tried to look upset. Maybe, she said feebly, maybe I I can face her next week. Honestly, Shacklebolt, show some sensitivity, Draco drawled, patting Hermione's hand. There, there. Kingsley glared at both of them, but said nothing. I expect regular reports, Potter, he snapped, stepping up to the fireplace and scooping up a handful of flu powder. Flash of purple, and he disappeared in the flames. You are all free to go, McGonagall said, looking at them over her glasses. I trust I don't have to tell any of you to be discreet once you leave this office. You might want to tell Potter again, Malfoy said, since he occasionally feels compelled to share classified spells with dimwits. Draco, Hermione hissed, taking his hand and pulling him towards the door. Oh, the next few days were going to be horrid. What are you doing? Draco asked as she dragged him down the spiral spares towards an empty alcove on the third floor, concealed by tapestry. I'll snuggle you if you like, but I'm so quite cross about... Draco! A sweet voice, soft but oddly penetrating, sang out from the other end of the corridor. Draco groaned softly, for it was Luna, of course, wearing a long blue cloak and carrying her heart-shaped net. Love good? Draco said, through slightly gritted teeth. How are you? Luna, remember? And I'm just lovely. Draco, thank you for asking. The Ravenclaw beamed at him. Neville was quite helpful with my plan to create a meditation garden near the Malfoy cellars. He says magical bee bomb will attract doxies and butterflies and actually absorb the blood still dripping into... Draco looked horrified. As well he might, and Hermione quickly stepped in. What are you trying to catch today, Luna? She asked, although she knew the answer. Love diggers, of course. Luna giggled, then she frowned. I expected them to swarm around you two, but I don't see any at all. Hermione didn't know whether to be relieved or offended. It's a beautiful day, she hazarded. Maybe they're all outside. Luna shook her blonde curls. Oh, no, she said. Love diggers are like small, enclosed spaces like that alcove there. She pointed to the nearby tapestry, portraying magical monks weeding a garden. Perhaps if you two went in there and were a bit creative. Hermione. I strode up to them, waving a parchment. Oh, bugger. I've been looking for you since lunch, the head boy cried. We're choosing a guest announcer for the Quidditch match. He stopped at the sight of Draco. The Slytherin cast only a hooded, contemptuous look, but remained silent. Is there a list? Hermione asked, moving closer to look at it. Ernie nodded. I'm trying to get Puddle as captain, but the prefects want George Weasley. Hermione almost groaned aloud. George had become a bit of a radio personality after the war, following up on his Pottermore fame. He even had his own weekly show, sponsored, of course, by Weasley's Wizarding Weezers. Well, that won't do at all, Hermione said with decision. I'll... There they are! Nuna waved her net wildly, nearly clocking Draco on the head. Stand a little closer to Ernie, will you, Hermione? The diggers just love you two. Draco stepped forwards, displeased. That will be quite enough, he said in rolling tones. Hermione has enough to be going on with without doing your job, Macmillan. He slid an arm around Hermione. And I'd wager ye Luna here has many fine suggestions for a guest announcer. Draco's lip curved. As I recall, she's done the job herself. Oh, yes. Luna allowed the net and took Ernie's arm. Have you considered my father? She asked, drawing him down the corridor. He was quite a public speaker in his day. Why, in 1986 he hosted. Hermione stared after them opened mouth. She honestly couldn't decide who would be worse, George or Xenophilius. She spotted another figure in the corridor and took Draco's hand, drawing him behind the tapestries. I'm not snogging you here, Draco said decidedly. 
Not with love good running around with that net. Let's... No, no, Hermione said, pulling away. Harry, she hissed, in here. She stuck out an arm from behind the tapestry and flapped it up and down. Oh, there you are, Hermione, Harry said, slipping into the alcove. I was looking for... Malfoy? Sorry, Potter, Draco said. I don't swing that way. Harry scowled. Harry, Hermione said, casting a spell against the eavesdroppers and ignoring the byplay. We're running out of time. We have to get a sample of Lucius' blood. Oh, I know, Harry said, reaching into the pocket of his aura robes. I have it right here. He held up a vial filled with deep red blood. Hermione felt like hugging him and almost did, except the archive was very small and hugging him would push him into Draco, which neither wizard would particularly appreciate. So she contented herself with beaming at Harry and hugging the sleeve of his aura robe. Harry smiled down at her, a smile that widened when Draco cleared his throat significantly. How do we know it's my father's blood? Draco asked. Harry pulled out his wand and tapped the vial, revealing Lucius Abraxas Malfoy in glowing gold letters. We got lucky, he said. Lucius' blood was amongst those drawn to test for Azkaban's magical virus. I read about this, Hermione said eagerly. It was in St. Mungo's monthly newsletter. The hospital has a program to control the virus that involves identifying carriers. Harry nodded. Lucius is a high-profile prisoner, and there'd be no end of trouble if he fell ill. He's clear of any viruses, so the vial was put into storage. How did you get the vial? Hermione asked. Penelope Clearwater? Harry put his wand and the vial back in his pocket. She's working there on the St. Mango's apprenticeship program. I gave her co-worker a ten-ton toffee and nicked a vial while she was sorting him out. Then what if she discovers? Harry grinned. She won't. I filled another vial with my own blood. They're magical labeling vials, Hermione said. How did you fool it into thinking it had Lucia's blood? Harry rolled his eyes. I dripped my blood into it while wrenching about my hatred of muggles and how I missed abusing house elves. Merlin's pen, Hermione, it's a stupid vial. I put Lucia's blood into it, fixed the name with a stasis charm, then replaced it with my blood. We need to tell someone. We can't allow St. Mungo's to use vials vulnerable to tempering, Hermione said. Hermione? I'm not wrecking my aura career over a vow that you asked for. I'll just write Penelope when all this is resolved. This will never be resolved if you two don't stop bickering. Draco said, drawing glares from both Hermione and Harry. I'd like to hear about the progress that Potter has made, if any, on getting my father's visitor locks. It seems like I do all the work around here. Harry grumbled. Hermione sniffed. Perhaps you'd rather create an experimental blood potion from scratch? It is an eternal mystery to me, Draco said loudly, that you two ever managed to defeat v Voldemort. I say the two of you because nothing can convince me that the weasel was anything but comic relief. Harry and Hermione began sputtering, but the Slytherin just rolled on. But I'm going to assume that Potter does have the ability to conceive and execute a viable plan and will once again ask if he has obtained my father's visitor locks. Hermione felt a little abashed, and she knew Harry did too. Marlin, Draco sounded just like Theo there. Did all Slytherin men give stern little lectures like that? And why was it so sexy? I don't have them, Harry admitted. The prison put a new security system in place after a bunch of visitor locks was leaked to the Prophet. The Ministry is still getting flocks of owls complaining about recorded visits to Azkaban from manicurists and tailors and... He coughed. A woman offering, uh, services. Draco shot her money a lute look, obviously expecting her to be outraged, but she just smiled. The aliments, she said brightly. What? Harry and Draco asked, looking identically buffered. A group of owls is called a parliament. It's like a mud of crows. Is that what you did while you lot were hunting Horcruxes, Hermione? Draco wanted to know. You just walked around saying, It's a tiara, Harry, not a diadem. You see how it tapers around the head? Draco ignored her glare and continued. Oh, I stand by my earlier statement that the fact you two managed to fulfill such a needlessly complicated quest to defeat the dark Voldemort is nothing less than a miracle. Hermione turned back to her friend. Harry, she said all cool politeness. Perhaps you'd like to continue your explanation of Azkaban's new security measures surrounding visitor logs. Yes, of course, 
he answered just as politely. Visitors logs are considered classified information to prevent leaks, and even auras require a warrant to gain access. Thank you, Hermione said. Draco and I have a free period right now, but the third years are in the potions dungeon. We can meet at the potions lab at four o'clock. Rogue viruses? Information leaks? Draco said cheerfully just to stir things up again. You auras are to be commended. It's a wonder half of Azkaban's prison haven't escaped. Auras aren't in charge of Azkaban anymore, Harry told him through clenched teeth. The prison is now run by a special department overseen by St. Mungo's. Hermione nodded. With the departure of Dementors from Azkaban, the Ministry had developed the MSA, or Medical Security Agency. MSA guards were part healers, part auras, and the goal was to treat and rehabilitate as well as incarcerate the inmates. Oh, I feel safer already. Draco was drawling. The two men glared at each other, each with a back against the wall and a narrow alcove, arms crossed, only two feet apart. Hermione had enough. They were both insufferable. She slipped out of the alcove and cast a complicated skein of strong wards on a tapestry. You no doubt Draco and Harry would break through, but it would take time and cooperation. Well, you look quite smug, Hermione said a smooth voice as she was scaling the third floor stairs towards the Gryffindor Tower. What have you done this time? The voice was playful, but when she turned her head, she could see that Blaise Zabini's face was quite the opposite. She had never seen his eyes so cold. I just trapped Harry and Draco together in an echo, she said. You know, the good one for snogging behind the tapestries of the magical monks. You never cease to fascinate me, he said. Hermione merrily smiled and turned to leave, but Blaze's voice stopped her. Hermione, he said tightly, is Potter staying here for Ginevra? He turned back. Blaze always knew the latest gossip. He was worse than Theo. No, she said carefully. He's here to help McGonagall reassure parents after the third blood message. Blaze blinked his long, dark lashes. That's a story, anyway. It happens to be the truth. Perhaps. Another slow blink. Tell Ginevra she can't hide from me forever. Hermione touched her wand inside her robe pocket. She's not hiding. I'm not telling her anything. And that sounded like a threat. Relax, little lioness. He said with a condescending arch of his eyebrows. I'm not threatening anyone. I just want to talk to her. He leaned towards her, and his voice took on a husky timbre. Tell her, Hermione. Tell her not to be frightened. Tell her. His voice became breathy. I know she misses me. Hermione's paws sped up a little on the blaze's lethal charm, but was too smooth, too practiced, too cold. Spispers weren't like Draco's with that dangerous heat, or even Theo's with that smiling quality. So she leaned forward, letting her own voice fall to a whisper. Oh, Blaze, she breathed. I'll tell her to stay the hell away from you. He leaned back, eyebrows drawing down in what would be a fiery glare on anyone else's face. I doubt you just want to talk, Hermione went on coldly. Try a letter. And never incendiate it as you did to Draco's. He looked down at her implacably. Should I crawl to Griffin or try to beg forgiveness as he did? Sob about my sorry past? Unlike him, I refuse to make a fool of myself. Hermione eyed him, wondering for the first time if he truly supported her and Draco's relationship, or if his pretty speech at Sarkorn's party had been all an act. Perhaps he only tolerated Hermione while he was dating Ginny. Perhaps she'd been right to doubt his and Pansy's motives. Perhaps he wasn't truly Draco's friend. She shrugged mentally. Blaze probably liked Hermione well enough, in his own way, just as he cared for Ginny in his own way. Just didn't like his way. Go whisper to some other girl, Hermione said, nettled by his assessment of Draco. I'm sure there's some cold beauty out there who wants to live a glamorous life with no messy feelings. What do you consider Astoria? If you can pry her off the mail for diamonds, you'd be doing everyone a favor. Well, that did it. 
Blaise's eyes actually narrowed and his lips thinned. Any other man would be raging in fury. Hermione gave him her snootiest look, then turned and walked up the stairs, feeling smug again. Hermione, too. Slytherins, zero. To be continued. Next up, Harry is disturbed. Draco is unimpressed. Thank you for listening to this chapter of The Gloriana Set by Thea Moon. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, Spotify or AO3.